It's World Bedwetting Day 2017, another day for awareness for bedwetting, a disease condition that is impacting a lot of families, their quality of life. Hi, Kostas. Hi, Guy. Is there any good definition for bedwetting? Well, yes. Um, the current definition um, for bedwetting is the involuntary loss of urine or incontinence episode, if you might call it, uh, beyond the age of five years. That happens during time, night time and when the child is asleep. Okay. Why exactly is it happening in some children and why in others not? That's a good question. So, I think most of the children would wet the bed, um, probably due to the fact that they uh, produce a lot of urine during the night time, whereas others would have problems with their bladder function, they can't um, accommodate all urine produced during night time, and still, of course, for both type of children and for uh, an enrhesis episode to occur, that means that the child has not, shouldn't be able to wake up when this happens. So the um, pathophysiology of enrhesis is rather complex, but there are many reasons, many um, uh, reasons for why children wet the bed, I think. So do I understand you well, the, let's say, main or the common a uh, problem is actually that children don't wake up at night. That is a prerequisite for the enuresis episode to occur. So if they, if children that do have to pass urine during night time that do wake up, then th that is the definition of nocturia. This is most commonly seen in adults. Children generally don't wake up when they have to empty their bladders. We've read some articles about snoring and uh, children who had their tonsils removed and suddenly they stopped betting, uh, bedwetting. Yes. What do you think about that? So it has been shown that both in children and adults, um, if you um, suffer from this condition that's called sleep disordered breathing, uh, that means that through activation of different hormone systems you end up um, producing more urine during the night time and during sleep. And that may be, in some cases, be the cause of bedwetting in some children. It has also been shown that if you treat that condition, and there are different ways to treat it, uh, by then in many children this can alleviate their bedwetting symptoms. So should we ask uh, the parents and the children if they snore when they come for bedwetting? I think that would probably be a good question, especially in those children uh, at least where um, different treatment strategies, strategies hasn't been successful, the uh, treatment refractory as we call it. Um, but in the end, I think we don't really know how, how many of the children uh, suffering from bedwetting uh, do have sleep disorder breathing. But generally I think that would probably be a good question if you have the time to ask about that. Okay. You know, when parents come with their children, um, there is always a little bit of guilt feeling. Mm. Um, so everybody is like in the family looking at each other. Is it mm -hmm. somebody's fault? Is it the fault of the child? Or did the parents do anything wrong? So if I have to say one thing that probably is one of the first things that we have to tell the parents and the children is that bedwetting is nobody's fault. It's not the child's fault, it's not the parent's fault. It's just a condition that is treatable and when this happens in the families where they do have children with bedwetting, um, then they have to seek for help. This can be treated. Um, I've heard also many stories in the news as well that children get punished after after a wet night and recently there have been also um, children that have been uh, severely injured due to the fact that the parents were very unhappy. Um, it's definitely not the children's fault and parents shouldn't uh, blame the children for that. So actually the World Bedwetting Day is an important day 
of bringing out information about bedwetting to the general public. Definitely. It's a good chance for the general public to um, learn a little bit more about bedwetting and a good chance as well for the families that have children uh, that wet the bed to understand that there is help to, um, to get and they should try to get it. Do you have any idea how long or when parents come to you because of bedwetting? It's like people and, and, and you know parents talk amongst themselves and they said, oh well, from what age should they actually come and see a doctor? Yes. Well, generally speaking, um, the condition should be um, treated or at least diagnosed uh, when the child is uh, five years old. Mm -hmm. And children that are five years old are still wet the bed. This is a, um, a condition that has to be treated. Uh, we feel then at this age, families can seek advice of their own uh, general practitioners to start with. But there's been still um, the notion that it is a condition that you just have to wait and see whether it goes away by itself. And in many children, perhaps this is true, but definitely not all children. And um, this is also why the, the reason why many of the uh, general practitioners or the families have been reluctant in diagnosing and treating the condition. I would suggest that families that do have children that wet the bed that are uh, of five years or uh, more, then they should seek advice at their general practitioners. How and common is it when you're five? How, if you would have a classroom of um, 25 children in uh, kindergarten, how common is it? How many of so them? For the five-year-olds, um, we think that studies have shown at least that it's approximately somewhere between 15 and 20 percent. So in a classroom where you have 25 children, perhaps three to five children would wet the bed. Um, and of course, uh, many children would do that every night, whereas others would do it perhaps two or three times uh, a week. And um, it is, it is common. If we look at the seven-year-olds, um, then it's approximately 10 percent. And if we still look at adolescents or adults, there's still approximately half to one percent of adults that suffer from bedwetting. I recall even uh, it was a family and I wanted to reassure the child, you know, he was six years old. So also to, to, to make it, I, I said, you know, I think in your class, how many, so he said, we are 25. So I said, okay, how can I explain to him like 15%? I said, there should be probably two or three other children in our class mm -hmm. that are also wetting the bed. So the child was looking at me and he says, who are they? <laughs> <laughs> if you could provide with the names, he would yeah, feel right. a bit better, it's like, I guess. Okay, it's trying <laughs> to explain statistics. Yes, that's true. But you, you, you are seeing a lot of children that wet the bed and trying to help them. What, what would you say to the family that first comes to you? What should they do? What's the first step? I think first of all, um, what I like to do is to explain the condition like you say. And you just explained, why do they wet the bed? You know, that's my first question. And my first question to the child is, why do you think you wet the bed? and other children don't. So it's, it's trying to involve the child in your treatment because most of the time it's the parents that are looking for treatment and they bring the child and they really would like you to make the child dry. And I think one of the treatment um, items is that if you just tell the parents what the treatment is, it won't work. The child really has mm. to be involved in the treatment. So I explain and I explain it to the level of the child, you know, that it's probably by they sleep so deeply, mm. you know, or they get very, very hard to be uh, aroused. And then I explain them also, it has something to do with their bladder and bladder getting full and is like overflowing. Mm. And that's, that's the first thing. 
So that is explaining to the parents and also, of course, like uh, you said, it's nobody's fault, it's not the child's fault. I think uh, that to be able to help the parents and to, to guide them what the best treatment option could be for this family is a very good voiding diary. So what is a voiding diary? A voiding diary um, in the preparation for a treatment, I think, is um, two days of uh, notification at what time the child is drinking, what he or she is drinking, when he is voiding, if there is any urge, if there is any leakage or wet underwear, mm -hmm. and that during the day, for two days. Most of the time I tell them to do this at the weekend because during school time it's very, very hard. In addition to this, let's call it voiding diary, I think we need a nighttime diary. And what's a nighttime diary? We have to find out how high the urine production is from this child. And that's quite easy to, to find out because I ask them for two weeks to weight the diapers in the morning and to measure the first void. Mm. It's very easy to measure. It's one gram in the diaper is one milliliter of urine. So they make the net weight of the diaper plus the first uh, morning urine. And then I show it to them at the next time I see them in clinic and I try to explain, you know, a little bit of, you know, what has, is there is some influence of drinking habits or when do they drink and what do they drink? at what time, and I compare it to them and I said, okay, listen, this is your average voiding volume, what you, you know, can hold during the day, and then look at how much urine you make during the night, and then they sort of understand that, wow, yeah, most of the time it's, it's overflowing. Mm. I guess you probably experience that many families won't be able to do so, such diaries or fill them out. Um, is there still something you can tell to these families that can help them? Oh, you're picking up such a, an important point. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't know exactly the number, but a lot of parents, they say, you know, why can't the doctor just fix the, the, the bedwetting? Mm -hmm. You know, what is he, why do we have to, to make all this notification? So, I have to agree that, you know, a couple of times, you know, parents come back and I say, um, okay, where's the voiding diary? Where is the nighttime weights of the diapers? Oh, we left it at home. Oh, we've forgotten it. Um, you know, but I think it's really quite important um, to be able to, to, to help them uh, for the exact treatment. And just also to try to explain mm. to them why is bedwetting happening. Mm. And that indeed it's, uh, as you say, I agree with you, it's a treatable condition, but it's not very easy to treat. Mm. Yes. So that's uh, that we've heard before. So what, how, what treatment options are there? Oh, I think, I think there are... Um, all kinds of treatment options, but um, it's mainly due to, I think we, we, we have to focus on the reasons. Mm -hmm. If you say, okay, the arousability, you know, we want to work on the arousability, I think the wetting alarm is an excellent uh, way of doing that. However, this must be a realistic choice of the child and the family because, you know, um, you know a, a wetting alarm, it's going off maybe once, maybe twice or three times during the night. The parents have to be able to wake up as well, help the child to become awake and so on. So it's, it's quite sometimes a frustrating procedure 
parents and children should be aware of that. Um, it's doable. It has excellent success rates, but it needs a lot of coaching. Coaching very closely, um, I think even preferably week by week coaching. Mm. That's one aspect. The other aspect is that we would focus on the urine production mm -hmm. and maybe even on the nighttime overactive bladder. Compliance, I think it's, it's extremely important and we may sit here and discuss with the family and the children and agree upon anything. If this is not going to happen at home, um, then um, there's no help to get in a way. And um, sometimes I was, when I started treating children with anuresis, um, I thought how difficult is that? They just have to reduce the amount of fluids before bedtime, remember, remember their medication, avoid uh, regularly during daytime, that's easy, easy stuff. But then I thought if you have to do that, to um, suggest to a five or six year old to do that every single day for months, then I guess that's a difficult task. I think an important part would be to support these families and, and especially the children that can see that perhaps this, this kind of strategy doesn't have an immediate effect, that uh, there's still an investment of their resources and their time. And as you said before, it's extremely important that they understand why should they do that? What can they expect afterwards? So, but it, it, you know, do I understand you well that you say this is a little bit also quality of life? That, for example, a five or a six year old just like to drink, let's say, his chocolate milk bottle before mm -hmm. to go to sleep and that you say, well, you can't have this anymore, or...? Well, well I think you can change some of the habits um, in the family without influencing their quality of life. Um, I think also that a lot of the people that um, we see in our clinics uh, don't really know the relationship between drinking and, and producing urine, for example. They have to, you have to be sure that, we have to be sure that we inform them about that. And um, regarding lifestyle generally, I think avoiding fluids before bedtime, um, discussing um, good habits regarding sleep hygiene, not having the iPad for a couple of hours before falling asleep or using the computer or this kind of uh, uh, habits, I think they in the end probably would improve the family's quality of life instead of reducing it. But I agree, it's difficult sometimes. If Parents come with their children and they say, you know, okay, the father says, for example, I, I have wet the bed until I, I was 10. Um, does it mean anything? Like, first of all, is there a hereditary factor uh, for bedwetting as such? And is there also, uh, let's say, a predictive factor that the child will also wet the bed until 10 when they do nothing? Mm. So we do know that the condition is hereditary. Mm -hmm. um, if both parents have been bed wetters, there's mm -hmm. a risk of up to 70 or 80 percent that the children are going to be wet in the bed. And already I think there, there have been descriptions of large families um, where the condition is uh, segregating in autosomal dominant way already in the 1800. Um, if you ask, if when we ask the children coming to our clinics, um, when we ask the parents, uh, very often w they would agree that, or they would confirm that they also been bedwetters. The problem is that also within the, the same family, the phenotype is uh, quite variable. Mm -hmm. So there could be in the same family children with bladder issues, um, as well as children with uh, large urine production, for example. Uh, uh, as the background for their bedwetting and it's very difficult to say or to prognose whether um, there are going to be dry at all and at which age. So the fact that the parents have been uh, perhaps bedwetters until a specific age doesn't mean that the child is going to be uh, growing out of his problems at that age. Um, so Okay, now when parents ask you can we 
do something to prevent that my child will not wet the, his or her bed so long mm -hmm. as I did? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I don't, I'm not aware of any studies that are looking upon prevention, but um, generally speaking and thinking about what parents could do, for example, uh, I think um, good habit, uh, habits regarding fluid intake, avoid that during the last hours before bedtime, avoid perhaps fizzy drinks um, and good hygiene regarding uh, sleep. Um, it's one of the things that they can uh, work with. For children with um, bladder issues, uh, it could be uh, beneficial to be sure or ensure that they are emptying the bladder at least uh, four to seven times a day. Sometimes we do meet children that uh, are very reluctant in um, visiting the bathroom, what we call the voiding postponers, and this mm -hmm. is not a good thing that we know. Um, but it's very difficult to say whether there's any way to prevent the condition um, in the end. We have uh, now in our mm. bedwetting resource center um, two recent uh, studies and publications that um, uh, breastfeeding could have, or the duration of breastfeeding mm -hmm. could have an influence on the resolution rate on bedwetting. Mm -hmm. So apparently the longer you are breastfeeding, the earlier your child could mm -hmm. stop with bedwetting. What do you think about that? I, I really don't know what to say about that. I read the articles with great interest as well. and. Um, I'm not sure whether there's a direct causative relationship to bedwetting um, from uh, breastfeeding. I don't know whether this could be a factor, um, a confounder as we call it, uh, that is related to other factors that could lead to uh, bedwetting, for example, whether it would be um, something related to the uh, social class of the participants mm -hmm. to the uh, questionnaire, for example. Um, I think before we start uh, advocating longer breastfeeding uh, for children, which is generally, of course, a good idea for other reasons, and promise that this would treat their bedwetting, the, we need definitely more studies. Oh, I absolutely agree with you. I sometimes think that what statistics you can prove yes, anything. Exactly, isn't it? yes. Very often, if I may ask you, very often we meet families that um, think that. Uh, there's a clear psychological background to the children's bedwetting. They're afraid that this is just a sign that they're not thriving, they're, doing, doing, they're not doing well at school or just experience something uh, very negative. What would you say about that? Oh, that's um, a very, very good point. Um, you all remember that people, you say, oh, well, the grandmother died or there was a new baby and then, you know, People sometimes they give reasons, um, but I think a lot of studies uh, actually they have proven that um, uh, the, the, this is actually not the reason and has nothing to do with mm. uh, bedwetting as such. Mm. Um, I think even it's um, bedwetting can have psychological uh, consequences. Mm. And I think that's the reason why we should be very, very good um, and thorough in our uh, diagnostic approach to find out maybe there are other factors, but the psychological factors, um, we have found now that um, this is not the main mm. reason for bedwetting. Uh, it's, there may be other co-factors um, like attention deficit disorders and others, but they are not really strict related to that. Um, we've seen that um, a lot of psychological problems that children have that actually will go away when you treat mm. effectively mm -hmm. bedwetting. And that's why I think we we should really focus on, on treating bedwetting mm. well and, and help all those families. Mm. Taking into account that in, in many children, is a, bedwetting is a condition that's going to be resolving by itself. Why should parents seek help? Is there any consequences for the children of their bedwetting? Well, it's, um, it's also a good point because, you know, 
when you look at it, um, people sometimes say, well, bedwetting, ah, uh, you know, it's, mm. it's not a big problem, just wear diapers uh, and wait. Um, I remember even a, a girl that I, I saw uh, where the general practitioner has told her, you have to wait until you will menstruate. Mm. Yeah. And then it will go away and the girl was 14 and she says, I'm menstruating already two years and it's still not there. So I really want a solution now. Um, so um, I really think that is uh, 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 very important uh, because it's really quality of life. Mm. Uh, and the psycho, social and emotional consequences of wetting uh, the bed um, is really very, very important. And it's, it's like some children get isolated, they don't dare to go to, to, to parties, they don't go for overnight stays, they don't, go, go, they don't dare to go on camps, because it's so associated with wearing diapers, and diapers is associated with being like a baby yes. treated. Yes. And I think this is why uh, really children and families deserve uh, mm. good treatment. So it's really important to explain and to really coach them, because I, I think for bedwetting there are solutions, but not very easy solutions. Mm. So you we really can help them, but the child and the family needs to cooperate uh, both uh, for a successful mm. treatment. That's true. I agree completely. So what do you think of ESPU this year? Oh, ESPU is a very nice meeting, a lot of people, very good sunshine in <laughs> Barcelona. And uh, we are looking forward actually to your talk tomorrow. <laughs> and a very nice session on uh, bedwetting research.